What's up, guys? Welcome to Stock Talk with Nico Criticos. Today, we're going to be doing some analysis into a stock that I purchased recently, and that stock is BFC. So I purchased about $1,500 of this stock, and as soon as I discovered it, um, I started researching it, and it really caught my attention, and I fell in love with it because I just thought, this looks like easy money to me. So here's the five-year chart. You can see in the last couple of years, it's hit around $100 a share a couple of times. Um, during the, the crash of 2020, it went down to $48. And now we're all the way down to 33. So I bought it at 33. Um, it did spend a couple of weeks trading down here at about 27, but I'm happy with it at $33. Um, when I run the numbers, I'm actually coming to an analysis of the minimum the stock should trade at is 26. The average it will trade at is 55. And the max PE ratio that it will hit is a 43. It's hit that a couple times in the last 10 years. And that would mean $100 a share where it traded at in the last couple of years. Now, those numbers are also just based off of the earnings, the EPS they're going to do for this year. And this year is going to be bad. They lowered their guidance. Um, and it's down to $2.4 of EPS. The, 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 the following year, it's expected to be 2.7. And I think they're going to get back to about $3 of EPS and then, you know, hopefully more uh, at some point in the future. But I think this is just going to, they're going to have a bad year, of course, because we have a recession. We have, you know, backed up inventory. We have inflation. All those things are pretty much hurting every, a lot of different retailers and similar companies. We're actually going to compare this to about, four other competitors up here. And I'm going to show you why I believe this is a good investment. So let's get started with the checklist here. Um, okay. So actually, before we get started with the checklist, I want to open up, where is it right here? This is their website. This is, this, this is all the brands they own. Their biggest is Vans and North Face. They also have Timberland, Dickies, um, a couple more here. The ones I'm more familiar with are Jansport, and Supreme, of course. They purchased Supreme for $2 billion, I believe, in 2019. And then it was it's kind of a tough thing. This is what's been making their cash flow look bad. So 2019, they bought that company for about $2 billion. Then we had the, the COVID crash, right? So that messed up their business. And then ever since then, you know, the economy has not really gotten back to where it should be. So they're still dealing with those problems. Um, so it's 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 been tough on their cash flow statement. But if we keep going here, we can see that number one is is the stock down? And yes, it's down 57% on the year. So that's going to get a check. Number two, has the revenue been increasing and has the net income been increasing? And if we look at this, or not this, but this, we can see that this is tough because it's not very, very, it's not very consistent with the net with the net income or with the revenue. Like there's, you know, you see a pattern of it downtrending and then you see a pattern of it uptrending. So it's kind of hard to tell. Same thing with the net income, 1.2 billion, 1 billion, 614 million, then one point back to 1.2 billion, 600 million. Then we go all the way down to 400 million and then we go up to 1.38 billion. So it's all over the place. But I mean, 1.38 billion is, um, you know, that's, a big move up from where it's been in recent years. So, you know, it is what it is. This is a type of business where I'm not expecting huge growth. Um, if they keep, you know, acquiring the brands like they have been, and that adds on just an extra, you know, 5% to 10% growth for a couple of years, that's all they need, really need to do. This also is a big dividend stock. We're going to get to that. But so I put a revenue increase. I gave it a check. Net income, not really, um, you know, it, those could go either way. Then if we look at its price to sales, I put yes, it's only a price to sales of one, which is very cheap. So I'm very happy with that. And then next up, I gave a check to a healthy PE ratio, a forward PE, because it's trading at a 14 right now. Okay. Um, so there's different, there's different ways to look at this. Let's do 33 divided by 2.4. It's trading at a 13.7. Now, if we look at next year's numbers, 33 divided by 2.7 is is trading at a 12. Okay. So I'm buying it at a Ford PE of 12 based off of 2024 numbers. Keep in mind the prior year, they did $3.1. So they have already proven they can hit those numbers. 
a 2.7 should not be that hard for them. And then eventually they should get back to that $3 plus range of EPS. But so keep those numbers in mind. For this year, I I bought it at a P ratio of 13.7. For the following year, I bought it at a P ratio of 4 PE of 12. Okay, 12 and 14 if, if, if you want to compare it to this year, right? Now, if we take a look at the 10, this is tw the last 12 years of where the stock is traded and what PE ratio it's traded at. And what you're going to see here is the cheapest it got. Now, this is an exception because we had a COVID crash, right? That's not going to happen. An 11, okay? The cheapest it gotten is an 11, and then it hit 44 as a PE about four different times. It actually went higher. So there it's a 43. Here it went to 53. Here it went to 66. And here PE ratio, that's kind of ridiculous. But... If it does shoot up to a 40 or so, then that's, you know, that's great. That, that could mean that's where we're going to see that $100 share right around a 23, you know, maybe 25. It spent some time up here in the 28 range too. So, but on average, let's say 23, okay? 23 times 2.7 is $62. So that's where it should be trading, where it's average PE times 2024 earnings. That's a share price of $62, okay? That's almost a double up from where we're trading at right now. So just keep that in mind. That is something that is very convincing to me. Then we look at, is the company innovative? Does it have a moat? I put no, not really. They're not really innovating. And their moat is just, you know, I don't see, it's just, it's retail. There's other brands that do the same thing. Um, I know that can be very volatile. It's just a matter of what's, you know, what's hot and what's trendy. But if they keep acquiring brands, I think that's a great thing. Like Supreme, for example, I think that's a great acquisition to make. So then we get into, is the industry growing? Yes. Um, you know, it, we're talking about shoes and we're talking about clothes. The nice thing here too is it's not just, you know, it's not just uh, fancy clothes. It's not just cheap clothes or expensive shoes or cheap shoes. It's it's both. It's a mix. You got Supreme that sells t-shirts for a couple hundred dollars. And then you got Dickies that sells t-shirts for like $10. So it's a nice mix there. Um, so they shouldn't do, they shouldn't do that bad in a, recession i would think so i would say the industry is growing you know people are always going to need clothes and shoes is the return on invested capital strong or improving i put no it's a 12 percent on average and currently it's five percent again up till the pandemic they were doing fine it was right around 12 percent and it was 12 percent is, is good but then since covid you know it, it went back up to like nine and now it's falling back down to about five so no it's not good they're dealing with the same problems as other companies, you know, it depends on what inflation turns out to be in 2023. Are we going to see crude oil prices keep going up? Um, you know, how are transportation costs and stuff like that? Are the margins respectable? I put yes. This is where I wanted to compare. This is interesting when you compare against other companies. Like, so this is VF. I, I believe it stands for Vanity Fair. Then we have Nike, Under Armour, Columbia Sportswear, and... Um, Ralph, right? So let's start with VF. We can see here to 10%. And as you can see, ever since the pandemic, it's been all over the place, everywhere from, you know, back down to three. So not great. But on average, nine to 10% is what we would expect in a normal economy. Then we go to Nike. And if we look at Nike's average margin, we can see that it is pretty similar. It's also around you know, here we got an 8%. It goes all the way up to about 12%. And it, you know, is... well, it'd be nice to be reloading, but the bottom line is all these companies pretty much trade right around that 8 to 12% profit margin. They pretty much average about 10%. So they're all kind of doing the same thing here. And they're all inflation. All right, we'll get back to that. But they're all about 10%. So it is respectable. Number 10, how's the cash flow? This gets a no. For a couple different reasons. The biggest one, or one of the biggest, is you got to look at how much cash they have, how much debt they have, and how much are they paying off in dividends. Because in this case, they're paying a lot in dividends. Uh, I believe their average operating cash flow, it's very volatile, but on average, it's about 900 million. Okay. So, first, I want to check how much debt this company has and how much cash. So, we got Equity has gone from 4.2 billion to 3.5 billion in the last three years. Okay, come on. 
Now we're down to $3 billion. So that's not good. That's not good. But again, they made that $2 billion acquisition, and then they ran into, into the pandemic. It's been a tough past three years for them. So we got 5.6 in current assets and 5.3 in current liabilities. Here's debt. Um, debt and payables is right over $5 billion. And they only have a half a billion in cash, inventory of 2.7. That's not good. That's that's not a good balance sheet. The other thing to mention here is, although there's things like that that make the company look weak, this company has been around since 1899, and they've been paying a dividend and raising their dividend for 50 consecutive years. So if that's the case, then there shouldn't be too much to worry about. And with those, with that network of brands they own, it's one thing if they just own Supreme. Let's say they just had Supreme and they just had North Face or something, right? Two higher end brands. And that'd be a different story because one, a recession, those companies are probably not going to thrive in. And two, if one of those companies goes under or they sell one, or let's say the Supreme acquisition doesn't work out, they're in a tougher spot. But they have, you know, a dozen plus brands of something like Jansport, something like Dickies that are things that people will buy on a normal basis. And so I, I like their diversity as far as their brands go. But operating cash flow, we can see it's been $1.6 billion in 2019. So that's in a good year. That, that was before the pandemic. Then they went to $800 million, following year $1.3, then $800 million, and now $120 million. Not very good. And as you can see here, financing cash flow. Okay, so cash dividends paid seven hundred million dollars, over seven hundred million, and they only made a hundred million. So not great. That's why the payout ratio looks so bad. Free cash flow was negative. Again, that's not good. Hopefully, twenty twenty three we'll see a different story with that. But that's why that gets a no. I'm just gonna close these out. You guys are just gonna have to trust me. It's ten percent. Have diverse revenue streams yes not only do they op operate internationally but they also have all those brands like i mentioned so that's another reason more assets more assets and liabilities yes but barely is equity over 10 percent of the market cap yes the market cap is about 12 billion is what we're paying for it and their balance sheet has what three billion dollars of equity right share count decrease this is one of my most important things to look for i like looking for this and if we go here, we can see that in fact, share change year over year, minus one and a half percent. Good enough for me. Are insiders interested? Yes, they are. If we check here, <clears throat> and let me just tell you, I've been checking this website for about at least a hundred other companies of what the insiders have been doing. And 90% of them, the insiders are selling. Even that you look at some of these stocks that you think are great prices, you know, I look at Adobe, Intel, Intuit, all these different companies, insiders are not buying, even with the stock prices down 60 plus percent. So it's hard to find a company where insiders are buying shares. So this is the last, let's look at the past year for VFC. We have seven buys and two sells. That is definitely one of the best uh, reports that I've seen. So here we can see these, we have the, you have the, all the different, you have the directors purchasing shares, at 41, 44, $45, $50. And we're paying, and I was paying 33 bucks a share. Then you got this guy selling for $50 a share. This person selling for 76. Earlier this year, eight, nine months ago, they were buying it at 45, 56, and even $64 a share. So they were buying at those prices and they're putting in, you know, some of these are big, This like this is a half a million dollar investment almost. And we're talking, it was, you know, almost double where it's trading at today. So that's a good sign. Is it, do they have respectable management? Yes. Um, I don't love the CEO. I got to say, I, I always like a CEO who's either innovative or ambitious or, you know, has really good energy. This guy, I don't really get that feel from him, but I have to say it's a great move. I think acquiring Supreme and again, they've been paying dividends for 50 years. Obviously they're doing something right. Profit margins aren't horrible. They're, they're, well, they're, I shouldn't say that. Profit margins are good. They're in check with the rest of the, the companies. 
balance sheet does not look good. Um, cash flow statement does not look good. But once again, I would think that would be a temporary thing. If this company's been around for over 100 years, paying dividends for 50 years, and just the last three years look bad because we had a pandemic, then that makes sense. So I would think in the next couple of years, we're going to see them get back to normal and that won't be a problem. One thing I would, I mean, so the dividend yield is over 6%. It's like 6.2%, 6.1% here, right? That's big, especially they, they, they were paying out, you know, six times more in dividends than what they were actually earning. So I wouldn't mind if they actually cut down that dividend. Maybe they, maybe they can make it a 4% dividend right now or something like that. So that would help. To, I'd rather than pay off that debt and get a healthier balance sheet. And then do they have more cash and average earnings? No. Remember, I think it was just a half a billion dollars in cash on the balance sheet. And this company is normally doing like up to 1.3 billion in um in, in net income. 1.3 billion, sometimes a billion, sometimes 700 million. So I think they should have at least five over 500 million in uh, cash. Do they have a healthy dividend? No, this was tough because this is tough to say because it's very it's a very good sign. They, how I said, dividend for 50 years and they kept raising the dividend. It's a 6% dividend, which is a lot. That's, a, that's super strong. But again, it's not, I can't say it's healthy right now because the payout ratio is so high. They're paying out way more than what they can afford. So that's not healthy. Finally, is it over 20 years old? Yes. I believe older companies are safer to invest in. They have a more proven track record. And this company is over 100 years old, over 120 years old. So that's going to get a yes. So all in all, we have a score of 13 out of 19. That means this is an acceptable stock. And those are the reasons I bought BFC. Thank you for watching. Let me know your guys' thoughts down below. And I will see you in the next video.